Uh, so I'll kind of lay out our, our foundation, our strategy, uh, where we've been, kind of where we're headed. Um, also, why it's important to our customers, you know, and how we're delivering uh, for them. And then also just to kind of close out with a few sample projects as, as well. So uh, Norfolk Southern, we are a freight and logistics company. People primarily think us of a uh, freight railroad, but we do more than that as well. We also have uh, a, a truck service. We have drage contractors. Um, here's a, a map of our, our routes in the 22 eastern states, um, but we touch much, much more than this. So we've got over 260 shortline railroads uh, that we work with as well. We work with all six of the, uh, the, the five other class one railroads across North America and also our maritime partners. So don't just look at our routes as uh, thinking that's a set in stone. It's really more holistically about we are a part of this entire uh, supply chain uh, ecosystem, if you, you could say. So it's not just moving the goods that, that move the eastern United States. It's actually moving the goods that move America and in, in many cases, the world. Uh, we're very heavily invested in intermodal freight. Uh, we operate over 50 terminals in eastern United States. To put that in perspective, uh, that means every day over 100 million people in the U.S. wake up within 50 miles of one of our terminals. Uh, so it's a very dense network, a lot of uh, capacity there uh, for growth as well uh, that we're investing in. Uh, and we're also the largest transporter of, of finished vehicles and automobile parts uh, and metals in North America. So we're very connected to, to that supply chain as well. Um, we like to say at Norfolk Southern, we are in the business of a better planet just because it just so goes uh, to be that rail is the most efficient way to move product over land, you know, and so if cut, we can do that right now just based with current physics uh, and we're continuing to decarbonize as well. Um, you know, doing things that's good for business for Norfolk Southern is also good, good for the planet. This is our sustainability statement. It's really about how can we uh, integrate you know, sustainability in daily operations, just like we do with safety. Uh, and also, how can we help our customers and, of course, the, co the communities in which we, uh, we operate? Uh, we've got a long history in this space. Norfolk Southern actually founded our sustainability program in 2007. So we were one of the first companies in the U.S. to do so. You know, and at that time, uh, the thought process of our leaders was just, uh, first of all, it's the right thing to do. And secondly, driving efficiency is good for the bottom line uh, and it's also good for the environment and so in a nutshell sustainability is good for business uh, just like safety is good for business you know there's a lot of things on, on this timeline corporation or a company start at uh, it starts with small goals right just understanding where are you at uh, what are the topics that are most important to uh, your stakeholders uh, and then reporting of course reporting out on your progress on, on an annual basis and even sometimes even more free, more frequently than that. Uh, so our, our first chief sustainability officer, Blair Wimbush, uh, was appointed in 2007. I worked closely with Blair from 07 until his retirement in 2015 as we, we built out our program uh, at Norfolk Southern. Uh, I took over the reins uh, of the CSO position in 2000. So I've been in that role for the uh, 2020, excuse me. And so I've been in that role for the last uh, last four years. 27-year uh, history working in Norfolk Southern uh, with a background of a wildlife biologist, which is kind of rare for a, uh, for a railroader. So I kind of bring a unique perspective as we think about uh, some of our environmental impacts uh, and how can we, can we can lessen those. And I'll highlight those in a couple of uh, sample projects. Josh, could you talk a little bit about how your customers' our ex expectations regarding reporting have changed? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the focus we've had recently as far as reporting goes, Mike, is on the scope three emissions. Mm -hmm. So if the um, you know, average company over 90% of their emissions are in their supply chain, which is okay. scope three. And scope three is 15 different categories. So I would say uh, you know, since I've been in this role, uh the reporting uh started off very slow, but I would say it's definitely escalated. Uh, you know, we've got the SEC climate rule that just came out last week. Uh, even though they pulled back on scope three, there's still a huge focus on scope three because so many companies have uh, made decarbonization commitments yep. and that includes their supply chain. So I don't think that's going away, uh, you know, as far as the, re the regulatory environment goes. Uh, you know, we do have California, we do have Europe, uh, PN standards that require scope three reporting. 
So companies that are significantly doing business in those locations are going to have to report as well. So I think it's a, it's a lot of like understanding how do you um, measure those emissions, report those emissions, and then ultimately, ultimately you got to manage those emissions, right? And I would say we're in the really, really early stages of that when it comes to supply chain. So uh, the stakeholders that I primarily work with are listed on the, the left-hand side of the screen there. I would say, uh, you know, when we first started talking with investors, you know, um, you know, when we have calls with investors five, six years ago, it was primarily financial performance and governance. And now we engage with shareholders on an annual basis um, that control more than 50% of our stock. And they want to talk a lot about the E and the S issues, you know, listed on the right hand side of the screen there. Uh, you know, they've got, you know, not saying that they don't talk about the G issues and they understand the financial performance just based off, you know, our presentations and our filings with the SEC, uh, but they really want to understand what are we doing and what are the risks that the company may face when it comes to, to ENS issues, uh, but also what are those opportunities? How are we working, uh, you know, to, to do things that are actually better for society uh, and better for the environment as well? So I participate in those calls. And uh, it's very insightful to understand where the investor's perspective is. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, not surprisingly, there's a lot of focus uh, on the E-related issues from more multinational uh, investors. And I would say on the customer base as well. Um, you know, on the customer side, I'll do a, spend probably a third of my time engaging with our, our shippers. You know, so understanding the, their needs, uh, sustainability is important for them. The, a lot of them don't understand the value that rail brings you know, reducing emissions 75% on average. Uh, we're reducing wear and tear on roads, reducing highway congestion. Um, it's more economical in many, many cases. And so that really resonates, uh, particularly when I'm able to speak to my counterparts uh, at the shippers. You know, when you can talk to their sustainability team, that's actually setting goals and doing the reporting and managing the, the, the you know, the strategy for the company. It's really when we can make the, make the most impact. Uh, regulators, it's becoming more important for them. You know, we've, we, we have, we're a very regulated industry. Uh, we, we engage frequently with the Federal Railroad Administration, Service Transportation Board, uh, Department of Energy, the EPA, uh, all groups that I have conversations with on a regular basis, uh, particularly around uh, decarbonization and what are we doing to, to address climate change. The, the issues you see on the right-hand side of the, the slide there, the E and the S and the G issues, um, those are the topics that are most material to Norfolk Southern. And so those were identified through surveying our stakeholders uh, back in 2021. Uh, what are the areas that are most important for Norfolk Southern to the success of our business? But also, what are the areas that we can actually impact and, and make a difference? Um, and what's interesting, we call it an ESG report now, right? Uh, ESG's uh, gotten a lot of backlash just for the, the verbiage, right? Uh, but I look back at our 2018 sustainability report not long ago, and 90% of the issues you see we're reporting on are the same as they were back in 2018. So as we think about how do we approach sustainability uh, and talk and communicate to people about ESG, you really have to drill it down to these individual subjects that actually fall under the, you know, look at the S issues, taking care of your labor, taking care of your workforce, emergency response. I mean, these are all good, right? These are all good business decisions uh, at the end of the day. And that's really what you have to tie it back to. Uh, and then, you know, it's not just doing things that are, are good for the environment. It's doing things that are really good for your business. So it's really about uh, understanding your risk, lessening your risk, and also how do you take advantage of the opportunities and build that into the strategy of the company. So I'm just going to focus on, on some of the E issues since we're talking about decarbonization. Uh, these are the five core areas that our sustainability advisory council team picked out uh, that we said that we can impact the most as, as, a, as a freight railroad. Uh, under each of these pillars, we have several strategic components. Some of those are, are listed here on the slide. Um, each of these pillars has a leader, uh, and they also have a cross-departmental team. And so these are folks that participate in these pillars uh, that work in various departments across Norfolk Southern, and it's how do we drive change, right? It's not just about having meetings for the sake of meetings. It's about how do we actually drive change uh, throughout the organization. Uh, the, the first pillar is, is carbon, which is really decarbonization. That group is really focused on our scope one emissions. 
Now, not surprisingly, locomotives account for over 90% of our scope one and two emissions. That's going to be very similar uh, with the other class one freight roads as, as well. Uh, so we're heavily incentivized, you know, decarbonize. That's our, our third largest expense. It's our largest form of emissions. And so we've got a really good history there uh, as a railroad, but also as an industry in, in improving our, our fuel efficiency. Uh, we also have a substantial vehicle fleet, uh, um, both our internal fleet and our contract drivers. Uh, we've got a lot of heavy equipment, um, you know, so it's very important that we work with our suppliers uh, as we think about those scope one emissions. Uh, scope two is more of our built environment. So think of all the buildings and infrastructure that we have across Norfolk Southern. Um, buildings just in general account for about 40% of all worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the construction and operation of those buildings. Um, it's not as large of a footprint for Norfolk Southern as locomotives, but still an important area for, for us to focus. So it's really thinking about the design of those buildings, making them the most energy efficient possible. Um, knowing that you got to justify the added investments, right? So you need to look at that. Uh, it's okay to spend more money as long as you can relate it back to the life cycle cost of, of that asset. Uh, and then, of course, this group also oversees our projects in renewable energy and also decreasing our, our water usage. Uh, circularity is kind of the, the new buzzword for reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, the rail industry has a great, great story here. You know, a lot of our assets are very long lived. So think locomotives. Uh, rail cars, the rail infrastructure itself, uh, and primarily most of those can be repurposed at the end of life. Uh, so we've really got a great success story there uh, when it comes to our circularity efforts. If you don't mind my asking, what repurposed for short line rail or could you talk more about that? Uh, which asset in particular? Well, you said, I think you said the locomotives could be repurposed if I understood correctly. Is that yeah, so lots of times our locomotives, so we've got a, a substantial program ongoing since 2016, actually modernizing our existing locomotives. So taking uh, locomotives that are 20, 25 years of age, okay, uh, take, uh, reusing about half of that material, uh, oh. adding all the latest and greatest technology, uh, extending the life of that unit to you know up to another 20 years, uh, improving fuel efficiency up to 25%. Wow, wow. It's a really good success story when it comes to how do you repurpose those. And of course, you know, as you suggested, Mike, we do pass along those assets uh, to many of the, the short line, many of our short line partners. Um, the third pillar is partners. Uh, I will admit when we first launched this, that was suppliers. We said, hey, it's going to be really important to work with our supply chain, right? We don't make locomotives. We don't make fuel. Uh, and so we're really going to have to engage with our supply chain. But as we've matured, you know, in our journey, uh, we, it became very apparent there's more folks that we need to interact with. It's it's our fellow uh, railroads, right? Uh, you know, we need to interact with them. It's our OEMs. Um, it's also the government. You know, when we look at uh, regulations or we look at funding opportunities uh, and working with our customers as well. And of course, working with research, uh, you know, such as such as universities. So that, that whole pillar there has really grown uh, as we matured. Uh, and then finally, nature. How do we approach nature differently? You know, we've got a, a lot of uh, real estate assets, uh, a lot of areas that they're being impacted by by climate change. How can we think about nature differently uh, as we approach that? You know, and how can we make things more environmentally friendly? And in some cases, uh, many cases, uh, save the company money or create revenue streams from ecological markets. And this is where I primarily work for uh, for twenty years uh, in the rail industry. So. For transport companies, what's what's the value of modal shift? You know, as more of these companies are starting to measure those scope three emissions, um, they're starting to realize how much of their emissions are contracted transportation. Um, many times it's a third, if not more of their emissions are in their transportation network. Uh, we've got a really, really strong story there uh, when it compares to truck, particularly long haul trucking, right? There's a lot of goods moving across North America, long, long distances by truck. Um, and we've got to be more competitive with that uh, as an industry because uh, it's good for the environment. And it's good for people, right? You know, if we think about where congestion is, particularly in the eastern United States and where some of those projections are out to out to 2050. Uh, and it's important to our customers. You know, at least 25 percent of our top 200 customers have commit had made uh, commitments to the science based targets initiative. Many of those have net zero aspirations as well. 
Um, historically, rail was thought to be three to four times, um, you know, less three or four times more efficient than trucking. Our data analysis supports up to seven times, though, in some locations, reducing emissions up to 90 percent. So that's if you do an apples to apples comparison, right? Um, and incorporating all the factors that go into making a move. So it's not just the direct fuel burn with hauling that shipment. You also have, have to include fuel burn for um, empty miles. There's a lot of empty miles, both in trucking and in rail. Uh, you also have to include fuel burn for, for idling uh, and equipment repositioning. So there's a lot of things that we, we've uh, uh, focused in on when we're calculating emissions and, and doing that apples to apples comparison. Um, every year, you know, our emissions are somewhere around 7 million metric tons. That's scope one, two, and three. And so our customers annually, we estimate they avoid around 15 million metric tons just by using our rail service over trucks. So if you put it in that perspective, uh, we're really climate positive, uh, you know, at the end of the day. And of course, reducing those truck miles across the, the U.S. continent uh, as well. I'm curious, Josh, if you don't mind my asking. Yep. When you do that analysis, to what extent do you factor in where the the energy is generated, right? Whether it's generated via coal or via some other source? Yeah, so this is just uh, comparing a uh, fuel burn. So this okay. is just uh, this is just diesel versus diesel. Okay, so okay, sorry. Uh, yep. We're looking at the primary fuel source for truck uh, and rail at this point. Uh, there are opportunities in the future, though, as we uh, deploy more things such as um, you know EV trucks or battery electric locomotives. Uh, that we would need other tools. But at this point, we're just comparing diesel versus diesel burn. Uh, what's really important for our industry, there's there's only six class one railroads, the largest railroads in North America. Um, and we have all committed to the science-based targets uh, initiative. Uh, that's really important. Um, it's alignment. And it's also getting the attention of our suppliers. You know, there's two primary locomotive OEMs in North America. Uh, it's definitely getting their attention as well. Uh, we've made really, really strong progress in fuel efficiency in our industry if we think back, you know, the last 30 years. Um, and if you take that transgression line, which you see kind of uh, plotted across the top here, um, we've got, we've been making steady improvement and that's investments in our fleet. It's a lot of things that we've been deploying, a lot of technology. Um, but that's not gonna be enough if we look at our collective targets you know, out to, to 2030, for example. So we're gonna have to do something to meet that gap. So this is one of the things that, that we're seeing right now, uh, you know, across corporates that they've committed to uh, SPTI. Um, and now the question from investors, regulators and customers is, well, that's great you've made a commitment, but what's your plan? How are you actually gonna achieve that plan? And so in general terms, Norfolk Southern knew that we were gonna continue to get fuel efficiency progress. Uh, we're gonna do low carbon fuels. We're gonna do renewable energy. Uh, but we really didn't have a, a exact drawn out plan or a way to model that. And so what we did over the course of this last year is we held five uh, workshops internally uh, hosted by a third party, uh, really to understand what are those, uh, what's that transition look like as we transition to a low carbon economy, as our customers transition, identifying the, the significant risk and the opportunities. And then finally, we held uh, KPI workshops to understand what are the things we're already doing? And believe it or not, we identified over 50 things we're already doing to decarbonize when it comes to scope one to two emissions. And there's about a dozen near-term items. And so we incorporated and uh, pull, pulled those all together and really put them into kind of bucket them into kind of three areas. Uh, so these are the three areas that we bucket them into. And this is what it's going to take us to meet our, our 2034 goal which is a 42% reduction in emissions intensity. So it's continuing to uh, invest in our locomotive fleet, invest in smart technology. So if we just think about the fuel efficiency bucket alone, there's probably 30 levers under there that impact locomotive fuel efficiency. Um, so each one of these has other components uh, besides what you're, you're seeing there. Uh, low carbon fuels, that's, that's something we're aggressively targeting as well. Uh, we more than doubled our usage just, just last year of biofuels. Uh, and then we're continuing to look opportunities as we think about the renewable energy space, whether it's uh, solar, or renewable energy credits, power purchase agreements, and so forth. Um, even though that only makes about three to four percent of our total, uh, you know, uh, carbon footprint. And so this is kind of our pathway. Um, it is available on our website, uh, NorfolkSouthern.com. Go to the sustainability section, and you can view an executive summary of our climate transition plan. 
Um, for those that are eager and want to go even further, there's a full climate transition plan. It's about 80 pages long. So it's definitely a lot more in depth. I will say this is a credible plan and it aligns with a lot of the international frameworks that are out there right now. And this is really what um, uh, the stakeholders are looking for is uh, coming up with a plan, modeling that out, showing you're going to meet your target. Um, and then now it's just a matter of how do we execute that plan. Josh, could you talk a little bit about the use of biofuels and rail? I, like, I don't know anything about that. Is it, what are the barriers to using more of it? Uh, could you talk a little bit more? Yeah, Mike, you know, historically, one of the barriers has been limitations by the, the locomotive manufacturers. Uh, we were limited for, for quite some time to a, a 5% solution, which we call B5. Um, and uh, they've been doing a lot of testing here over the last few years uh, in various engine types within the locomotive fleet seeing what the, the components, you know, if we go up to higher blend rates of both bio and renewable, uh, what are the potential outcomes, you know, from a mechanical perspective, what are the impacts on fuel efficiency, uh, you know, as well. And so uh, with that, we anticipate uh, getting approval um, by the end of this year for up to a B20 and up to an R100 blend. So to put that in perspective, a uh, 100% renewable blend, uh, depending on the feedstock, it can reduce emissions intensity anywhere from 50 to 80%. So that's a huge benefit when we think about how do we how do we meet our our targets going forward. Um, you know, it, cost of course has, has been prohibitive uh, on the biofuel side in a lot of markets, but there are states out there such as Illinois that are very aggressively offering incentives. Uh, so there's about five states that we really target right now for biofuel purchasing, uh, but there's other states that are looking at at low carbon fuels uh, regulations to incentivize those uh, to make them more cost competitive. Uh, renewable diesel, similar feedstock as biofuels, but it's a whole different process. So the end product, renewable diesel, it's a hydrocarbon, just like diesel. So in, in most cases, it's going to be 100% drop in fuel, whether that's for trucks or whether that's for, for locomotives. So that's really uh, uh, the best you know, product out there. Right now, there's a, there's a significant premium on that product in the eastern United States, even though a lot of the product is being produced in the Gulf Coast states. Um, and a lot of that's going to the West Coast. You've got street, three states there that have low carbon fuel standards uh, that really incentivize that production. Uh, but we do have states in the East looking at similar legislation as well, uh, including Illinois and, uh, and New York. So uh, we'll see how that goes in the future. Uh, the production is really ramping up. They're expanding the feedstocks uh, for these types of fuels, uh, which is really encouraging as well, because we compete directly on the feedstock space. Uh, with uh, the airline industry, you know, right. which is heavily focused on on SAF. Yeah. So premium, like 10%, 20%, um, just ballpark, out of curiosity. Yeah, I would say it's it's almost double. Wow. Double yeah. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> but it was triple last year. So <laughs> we're making progress, right? <laughs> so yeah, as, as more plants are converted over, uh, and that's what a lot of the refineries are doing, they're converting existing uh, you know, oil-based plants over to to these renewable fuels uh, and really uh, sorting that feedstock, you know, trying to get their hands and securing a long-term supply of feedstock. Uh, talked about the renewable fuels, you know, kind of where our industry is headed. This is kind of our pathway. It's very similar to maritime. Uh, you know, it's what are those low-carbon fuels available now? And in the near term, uh, how do we justify the cost of those products? Are there customers willing to pay a green premium? which there are in many cases uh, that we're finding out, particularly uh, European-based uh, companies. Uh, batteries have totally changed. As you all are aware, uh, Norfolk Southern, we actually built a, a battery electric locomotive back in 2008 uh, called the NS999. It had 1,080 12-volt batteries on it, similar to you would have on your, your vehicle, right? Uh, and it was, it was successful. Uh, we we read it. We, um, Relaunched that unit a couple of years later with newer battery technology, eventually sold that unit. It's still in operation out, out in California uh, at one of the ports out there. Uh, so we've done some experimenting in the battery electric locomotive space. Uh, some of these are just now coming into the U.S. market. Uh, there's one at the port of Long Beach. I was out there just uh, just last year uh, to see a you know 200-ton locomotive with no diesel tanks underneath, uh, and it's as quiet as a Tesla. You know, so to think there's no vibration, there's no noise. Um, the cab actually stays really cold, you know, for the operator because there's no heat coming off the components as well. Uh, I will say one of the, the issues, though, 
is that unit, uh, the charging capacity is equivalent to charging 83 Teslas at one time. And so even though it had a rapid charger with it, it's 200 yards from a major utility line. And six months after being there, the unit still wasn't hooked up to a fast charger. So as we look around our network, uh, where you could deploy these, uh, it's a huge obstacle. You know, as we think about our grid, you know, the capacity on the grid. So think of a yard location where we may have four, maybe eight locomotives that need to charge at one time. So imagine how much more capacity has to be there to be able to support that. So uh, it's a real challenge, you know, as we think about just electrifying everything, right? There's, you know, we've got a really aging grid uh, that's at capacity. You know, we're trying to decarbonize that grid very quickly. But as you're aware, it takes a long time to bring clean energy projects uh, online. So I think that's one of the challenges we face, not only in our industry, uh, but in a lot of, lot of industries. A lot of talk about hydrogen. There's a lot of opportunities there. Um, I will say diesel injection of hydrogen uh, or hydrogen injection in diesel engines is a really near-term solution that's been uh, being done right now. And the trucking industry uh, offers great opportunities for fast fueling and long distances. So it could, could compete in long distance markets. Uh, there's also opportunities there when we think about freight rail. You know, so taking existing locomotives, modifying those, uh, and the nice thing about that is you don't have to have hydrogen available at every location, right? So just changing out that whole infrastructure is very, very uh, expensive. You know, it's going to take a lot of time. So if you get to a location where you don't have hydrogen, you should use a, you just use 100% diesel, you know, and you get back to a location where you have hydrogen, you use the hydrogen. So uh, that's that's more of a probably a closer pathway. Uh, the Canadian one, one of the Canadian railroads, CPKC, there they are uh, working on a hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, locomotive. They got three of those units right now in piloting this year with support from the, the Canadian government. So I think it's a super, super early stages here. There's a lot of things that have to be worked out. Uh, how do you operationalize it? How do you afford it? Uh, what are the safety concerns? You know, um, for hydrogen, for example, it's a very low density fuel. You would have to have tenders behind every locomotive. So not just building the tenders, but what about the safety standards around those those tenders as well. So, so that's kind of the, the pathway towards the future. A lot of unknowns, a lot of things are going to have to be figured out, particularly over the course of the next, uh, next five, you know, next 10 years, let's say. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Is this future, is this 20 years out? Is it 10? I mean, you, you think 10 or? I think to get commercial uh, for battery electric locomotives, I, I would suspect you're going to be, um, you know, even right now the units are delayed you know, production. You're looking, if you order one right now, you'd be lucky to have it in three years. Wow. But think of how much, how much time it's going to take just to get units out there in operation yeah. to where we can start operationalizing it. So at best, you would say five, maybe eight years to really, you know, commercialize the, the battery electric locomotives uh, yeah. to get through that piloting phase. Uh, I think with the hydrogen fuel cell stuff, um, it's at least that long, if not, if not longer. Okay. But that's our path. And there's a lot of funding there. You know, we got $8 billion in the hydrogen hubs, uh, you know, from the federal government. Those hubs have been announced now. You know, we're, we're, um, we've been engaged in those hubs as well. You know, what are those opportunities to pilot with, uh, with the hubs and also with shippers? Yeah. So I'm going to shift right now and just kind of go into the, the customer base. Uh, we talked about the, the emissions. Uh, scope one is your direct emissions. So for us, that's locomotive diesel. Scope two, primarily for most companies, is going to be electricity. So the combustion happens off your site, and you're just buying the energy delivered to you. Uh, scope three, as I mentioned, has 15 different categories. It includes your upstream and your downstream supply chain. Um, you know, if a company, if their scope three is over 40% of their total emissions, then they have to have targets for scope three as well uh, through SBTI. Uh, put in perspective, you've now got close to 8,000 companies around the world that have committed SBTI uh, and many of those with, with net zero targets. So this has really shot up, uh, you know, over the course of, of particularly of the, the last three years. Um, you know, the graph here on the right, you can see the, the early ad adopters were, were prior to 2020. I would say some of the more mature companies there are like a Procter & Gamble. You know, I think they committed in 2018. Uh, they've been measuring the reporting and they act specific, they have public goals out there about how much they're going to reduce uh, 
truck miles and increase the use of rail, uh, increase warehousing space. Uh, a lot of pressure in the supply chain. You know, who's Procter & Gamble's number one customer? Walmart. Walmart wants them to decarbonize as well, and Walmart doesn't want their shelves empty. So there's a lot of pressure as we think about this whole supply chain ecosystem is how do we, you know, push decarbonization, uh, you know, across our, our supply chain. Uh, you know, you think about rail, uh, lots of folks, you know, kind of don't think about rail, right? Uh, you just assume it, it happens. You're not sure what we move. Uh, I like to always use the intermodal example. So these are some of our channel partners in the intermodal space. Some of them you've heard of, like UPS and FedEx, for example, some of the, the shipping companies maybe. Uh, so these are primarily the companies that do business with us when it comes to moving intermodal containers. So we ship around 4 million of those units uh, annually. Um, but the owners of that freight, who is actually the shipper, uh, is a much, much larger list. And here's just a sample of who some of those shippers are. Um, and a lot of these focus, these companies, uh, they're consumer brands, um, they're retailers, they're, um, they're manufacturers. They're very, very focused on sustainability. So at Norfolk Southern, if we look at just our top 50 BCOs, 90% of them have decarbonization goals. 90%. That's huge. And so these are the companies that are out there putting a lot of pressure on these groups right here. You know, because they're trying to ship their products most sustainable um, and they're a, a B2C, you know, so they're appealing to the consumer demand out there as well. You know, consumers that are willing to pay five to 10 percent more for a product, um, you know, for sustainability sake. So how are we helping our customers? You know, for, first thing we're doing is data. Uh, we went through a significant data analysis um, over three years of data, so over 20, 20 million points, 20 million shipments that we analyzed. How are we doing that? So a locomotive equipment perspective, it has more sensors on it than a Tesla. So we've got sensors just for fuel burn. We're measuring fuel burn up to every 15 minutes, and we apply that direct fuel burn to every shipment on that train based off its weight. So heavier shipments get more fuel burn, lighter shipments less fuel burn, and we track that for every shipment as it moves across our railroad. Uh, additionally, we add in fuel burn for the yard and local uh, move as well, um, also for empty repositioning. And if it's intermodal containers, we add in fuel burn for every time that object has to be lifted. And so in essence, we're capturing the entire life cycle of what it takes to move a shipment across our railroad. Uh, and with that, we looked at fuel efficiency at the commodity level. So historically, uh, the rail industry, if a customer asks for their emissions, we can say, hey, we moved uh, last year, we moved a, a, a ton of freight, 470 miles on a gallon of diesel. That's an average, right? You think, oh, well, that's a pretty good number. But what's the actual range by commodity type? It starts at 150 and goes over to 800. So there's a huge range when it comes to fuel efficiency because it's not just miles and gallons, it's also weight. So we're factoring in, in the weight of those products. And also the empty repositioning varies greatly by product as well. And so this is really core data. Uh, we use this to, to launch our next generation carbon calculator here a couple of years ago. That's publicly available on our website to any shipper to utilize. And it's being used by locations across the world. Does geography play a role in the fuel efficiency too? Uh, it does some. You know, the, the routes that you have, it definitely uh, plays a role. Okay. Uh, it does, you know, and also length of haul. You know, so you think right. of the Western roads, the Canadian roads have, have much longer lengths of haul, um, heavier items like us, you know, if you're going to have a lot more grain shipments or aggregate yeah. shipments or coal, for example, you're going to have a lower fuel efficiency. Uh, yeah. One of the least, the least fuel efficiency item we move is finished vehicles. Sure. Yeah. Because the weight of the cars, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, 20 tons of vehicles and the multi-level that's actually transporting the cars weighs 50 to 60 tons. Yeah. Yeah. And also the multi-levels are almost 100% empty repositioning. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. still have an advantage. You know, we still have an advantage over, over the trucking those. Uh, you know, the average, you know, truck is pulling around seven vehicles. Mm -hmm. You know, transport where's a multi-level, we're moving 10. Um, but interestingly, when we move to EVs, so the heavier EV products, a lot of those trucks now are only going to be able to support maybe four maybe five oh. at most. So it's really going to cut down on the efficiency of moving those via, via truck. Okay. 
So the other thing that we're able to do with this data, we mentioned, we talked earlier about reporting, um, you know, more of our customers reaching out to us for, for data on their emissions. So we can take those individual shipment emissions and we roll them up into a summary report for our customers. And I'll show an example here in a second. So it really gives them uh, very uh, sound data um, and it's based off primary data. So if you can get primary data, in many cases, you're gonna reduce your emissions right there. Because if you use one of the frameworks that are out there, SmartWay, GLEC, any of those, they're going to be very conservative. And so in many cases, you're going to overestimate your shipping emissions. Whereas by getting the primary data, not only is it going to be accurate, but we can help uh, customers reduce their emissions there. And then also recognizing our customers, you know, our customers and shippers. Uh, we had our, our, our event just last week, you know, in, in Atlanta, recognizing our 13 top partners from last year. Who are exceeding in uh, in areas of sustainability? So really, how do we bring those partnerships together and create an opportunity for uh, for uh, information sharing? Uh, we talked about the locomotive modernization program. Uh, just quickly, here's the here's the what the um, carbon calculator looks like. You got thirty commodities to choose from plus intermodal. Uh, you don't have to know anything about rail. You just have to know about trucking. Enter the trucking data. Um, and it will calculate the distances for you. So notice it calculates the distances uh, for both rail and highway independently. So those can, many locations or many origin destinations can vary greatly. Um, you can also input the, the truck grade in there as well. So it incorporates that. So this is really what we think that customers need when it comes to making decisions about shipment all, you know, options. And we're seeing that incorporate in some of the, you know, the larger shippers the logistics software is carbon is being factored in to those logistics decisions. Are empty miles in here somewhere? Yes, so it does include empty miles as well. So we're including empty mile repositioning for okay. both the, the truck and the rail. Yeah, oh, based, wow. off, based off the commodity type. Yeah, cool. Uh, that's available on our website. It covers the entire U.S. Uh, highway system and rail system. You can input over 75,000 locations across across the U.S. Uh, this is an example of an air motion, uh, um, um, emissions report. This is what our customers get, you know, that talks about what their savings from an annual basis. You notice in the top left, the right here, there's around a 79% emissions of savings for this uh, customer. So it really gives them some neat stats that they can take and roll up. Um, and it's really a great conversation starter for them as well. Uh, talked about the partner awards, just a few sample projects here. Um, we're heavily invested in intermodal. We've got a lot of these really, really large intermodal cranes. Uh, not surprisingly, many of those in the Chicago area. Uh, we've started upgrading these cranes. So historically, they were diesel hydraulic units. Uh, we started going with hybrid units in many locations. Uh, the, the ones pictured here on the left are actually fully electric units. Uh, these are here just outside of Atlanta. Uh, they are just now in fully operational as well. A uh, huge saving. So when you invest in these units, whether it be the hybrid units or fully electric, uh, they're going to cost more. But if you look at the total life cycle analysis of how much fuel you save and also how much downtime, uh, you know, there's a lot, lot less maintenance involved in these units as well. So it's really a win-win solution as we think about not only lowering noise for nearby communities, but we're also lowering the, the pollution. Uh, it's a great environment you know, for our operators as well. Uh, so it's really a win-win solution, and we've got plans to continue upgrading these cranes, uh, you know, across our, our network. Uh, we talked about rail cars. Um, there's a huge opportunity as we think about the North American rail car fleet uh, when it comes to uh, making them more efficient, uh, not only from a weight perspective, but from an aerodynamic perspective. And so this was a partnership that we, um, we entered into with the Greenbrier companies and U.S. Steel here a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's really, how do we take an existing gondola, you know, that's that's transporting a lot of different goods you see there uh, and make them more sustainable. And so through this product and uh, in, in um, improvements in steel, you know, high strength steel, they were able to reduce the weight of these units right about 15,000 pounds a piece. So that means for each unit, you can add more capacity. So if you're transporting steel coils, you know, uh, you know, across the, the U.S., you need less rail cars to transport the same amount. And at the same time, those units being transported back to you, you're carrying around empty, you know, empty cars at the end of the day. Well, when each one weighs 15,000 pounds less, it's a huge improvement on fuel efficiency. 
And we see a lot of opportunities in this space as we think about the rail cars, you know, the rail cars of the future, you know, all different types of rail cars, which were primarily 17 that we have uh, have in North America. So huge opportunities there uh, in the rail car fleet as well, um, you know, to, to improve efficiency and, and address emissions. And uh, finally, I'll just close out with a, a couple of, uh, you know, nature-based kind of projects. We've, we've been heavily invested in, in forestry-related projects, uh, both on our own property and also on private lands. Uh, how can we invest in forest-related projects, reforestate, reforest those, and, um, you know, create opportunities for landowners to put their land back into trees? It's great for the environment, not just the carbon sequestration, but the wildlife benefit, the flood control, uh, the sedimentation into our waterways as well. Uh, and at the same, you know, and utilize the carbon credits uh, that Norfolk Southern may need at the end of the day to apply towards our own emissions. So we really learned a lot, a lot from those types of projects. Uh, we've also been restoring waterways as well. This is one we did at our Lambert's Point facility up uh, in Norfolk on the Elizabeth River. Uh, this saved us, you know, it was about half the cost of a fully armored shoreline. We also did oyster gardening here. Oysters help sequester carbon. Uh, that's probably what's in their shells. Uh, so, and we've got a, a four acre offshore oyster reef planned for this location and looking at a, another uh, phase two of this, this project as well. Uh, and we've also been restoring, you know, wetland ecosystems on our own property. Uh, the second project we just completed uh, restored six miles of stream, five acres of wetland. So it's really about how can we do these things that are good for the environment, they're good for the surrounding communities, and these generate revenue at the end of the day. So this project, for example, it's going to be a 10 times return on our investment over a course of about a 10 year period. So really great opportunity as we think about kind of, you know, what, what's that future look like? How do we take advantage of uh, environmental and ecological uh, markets that are out there? Okay, um, this is maybe a dumb question, Josh. How do you generate revenue from this? Is it because you're selling? Yeah, maybe just if you get it. Yeah, so so for uh, for developers in that region, so if you think a lot of this, the credits we've sold so far have gone to infrastructure projects. Ah. So anytime you widen a, a road, uh, you you build a new, you replace a bridge, you're going to impact wetlands, yep. and you to offset those impacts. And by having banks available, uh, wetland banks, then we can provide credits for those folks. Uh, and that includes real served industrial sites as, as well. So it helps support uh, our industry, you know, our our business at the end of the day too. Okay, great. Yeah, so no, happy to, to close there and uh, and take any questions with the uh, the time we have remaining, Mike.